So good morning, I'm Victoria knight Canoni. I am a BioNexus Principal Scientist at ATCC. And today I'm going to be sharing with you um, a little bit about the untapped potential of ATC ATCC's mycology collection. Um, so I recently, well, I joined actually ATCC uh, almost exactly a year ago. Um, and I came here after working at several different biotech companies where I'd built strain collections. Uh, primarily on the on the microbial side, so bacteria and fungi. And I'd use these as starting points uh, for in different discovery programs, uh, either for antibacterials or for agriculture. So the opportunity to work at ATCC and, and work with the vast collection they had was obviously a really exciting opportunity, you know, not only to work on it for, for an inter as an internal discovery program, but really to provide tools for the scientific community to be able to use. And so really in the last year, I've been uh, building out a team to start thinking about what ATCC currently has in its collection and how we may want to expand that, but also quite honestly, how we might want to uh, make these resources more available to people to sort of provide how you could use them in your scientific research. Um, so a little bit about ATCC. You know, really the vision of the company is to be able to provide resources for the scientific community so that you know, there is a place where you can always go back to and get that authenticated material. Um, you know, it's, we'll, we know that you know, people do bring them into their collections and passage them multiple times. And sometimes you know, things can happen with those, um, those uh, strains that they have. And so this, you know, always provides a place where you can go back to the original material. And again, you know, our mission is to make sure that we not only have the resources, but we also make sure these are fully authenticated so that we can, each batch that we're making is tested and always make sure that it still retains the traits that it originally had. And again, our, so our core values really are to make sure that we are providing the things that our customers need. Um, and we're changing as the needs of the industry um, moves along. Um, so, so this is about ATCC. And so a little, bit, a little bit about our history. So ATCC is almost 100 years old. And since that point, we've been supplying scientists with the things that they need in order to do the research that they're doing. Um, if you see the pictures on the on the right hand side, this is one of the early headquarters for ATCC in Washington, DC. I believe at the beginning, our culture collection was actually stored in the basement um, of one of these buildings. And there were some pretty scary things um, that were stored there, which some of those have now been passed on to some other government agencies. And then at the bottom picture, you can actually see where, we, where our production facility is now. Uh, this is in Manassas, Virginia, and this is where our repository is, is housed. Um, and so all of the things that you would request would be sent from this particular facility. We do also have a, an R&D site uh, in Gaithersburg, Maryland. Uh, so all of the uh, samples that we have, those are prepared in a facility that is ISO um, accredited and certified. Um, and because of that, we are, are one of the leading global suppliers of authenticated cell models, viral and microbial standards. Um, but we're also doing research ourselves. So we do have an R&D site, as I mentioned, this is in Gaithersburg, where we're coming up with products that we think could be useful from some of the original materials that we have. Again, we're always looking for what you know customer needs are and what could we uh, create from some of these original products that could be useful. Um, in addition to just having now cell lines, microbes, we also do provide services uh, that can be, you know, helpful uh, for our customers, such as authenticating the materials that we have, but also preparing uh, cell lines or, or um, um, lots of materials that are done under CGMP conditions. And we also have a biorepository where we can store materials for our customers. And then finally, we have a patent repository. So we actually, you know, if someone is, is submitting a patent and they need to put their materials into 
one of you know a culture collection we have a place where those can be stored so sort of as far some information on our collection again we have both cell biology and microbiology collections in our cell biology catalog we have more than 5,000 different cell biology products. These range from primary cells, so cells you know, immediately isolated from the source. Uh, we then also have immortalized versions of a number of these different primary cells, um, which can be used obviously in lots of different research formats. And also more recently have started adding now 2D and 3D organoids. Uh, we have a collaboration with the NCI, which means we have a large number of these organoids that are available. And that comes no, not just with the cell line, but also with sequencing data to, to verify they are what they're supposed to be and some of the traits associated with them. Um, in addition to just having the materials, we also are, you know, have the authentication data around them as well and are starting to think about how we can modify some of these cell lines to create things like reporters that could be used. For our microbial collection, we have more than 70,000 different microbes. This is bacteria, yeast, fungi, protozoa and viruses. Um, and we also have for many of the in many of these cases, we have nucleic acids um, and polysaccharides for these uh, materials. We know that a lot of our strains are used in standards. And uh, again, so this is why we always want to make sure that each batch of the material that we produce is exactly the same as the master cell bank. And so if it is known to be antibiotic resistance, for example, we make sure that the new batch also uh, maintains those anti antimicrobial resistance features. Uh, that we know that also we also have uh, products that are used in as NGS sequencing standards and also as microbiome standards. So these could be single microbe um, or they could be a mixture of materials. So these are all available in our catalog and can be can be ordered. And I spoke about this a little earlier, but we also are making sure that we're doing authentication as we release our products. So on the cell side, this is making sure that they are pure, uh, making sure that they, again, hold the same traits as the original did. It's done through um, SCR testing and CO1 assays and making sure they're sterile. On the microbial side, we're making sure that, you know, we know what they are by 16S or ITS sequencing. Uh, we've now recently started actually getting genomes for our microbes that are going through production and anything new added to our collection. These genomes are all available through our ATCC genome portal and can be downloaded um, for your use. We also, for many of our strains, have uh, mass spec profiling uh, through MULDI-TOF and also looking at toxins. Obviously, we also look and make sure that these cultures are, are clean um, and are only a single organism and do this just through standard you know, plating out of the microbe, making sure there's only one thing there. And again, as I already mentioned, also looking to you know, do they, are they resistant to certain antibiotics? If that is listed on the product specs, then those are also tested every time. So I mentioned we're, we're adding genomes to our authentication pipeline. This started uh, in about 2019. We started doing this you know, to complement the things that we're already doing. Um, again, this is something that we're really excited about for our own use, but also we know it can be useful for our customers as well. So, you know, this will allow us to see really the true potential of some of these microbes and, and how they could in fact be used uh, for industrial purposes. So again, this is just shows you that all of our genomes are available uh, on our genome portal. You can just go to genomes.atcc.org and you can search for all of the available products that we have and, and download these uh, just by registering for them. There's no need to uh, purchase the micro at the time that you download. It's just that that, mater that material is available for your use. 
So a little bit of about history of the mycology collection at ATCC. So I mentioned already that ATC was established in 1925. Um, it's, this was meant really as a place where researchers could go and they could um, access microbial collections uh, for use in research. Um, and so this collection sort of continued to grow and by 1927 had we had almost 2000 uh, microbes within this collection and the first catalog was then published this is actually sort of impressive in that you know we're building a collection even while the country is in a depression so it really was a good place for people to be able to store their microbes again you know over time we began uh, freezing these cultures and maintaining a single source um, and then also, you know, um, providing not just now master cell banks, but also lots that could be distributed. So separating those into a material that could never be touched to things that we would send out uh, for use. So one of the things that, you know, we struggle with at ATCC is that the collection is very big. And, you know, so again, by 1975, we had 10,000 mycology items and almost 4,000 of those were sold and distributed, you know, annually. So the, you can see there's lots of things there that need to be produced. Some of them are requested over and over again, and some of them are only requested one, once or twice. But we need to make sure that we have those materials available as people are requesting them. Uh, so the key things on this on this timeline really are that um, ATCC did receive funding for the production of these of this uh, culture collection uh, from 1972 to 2008. But since 2008, uh, ATCC now fully funds the production and distribution of this culture collection. Um, so this is, you know, obviously why we need to charge for these cultures is that we are paying, as I mentioned before, sort of this long tail. So we need to make sure that we have all of these materials available for you. And so, you know, uh, it obviously to maintain a large collection like this is, uh, does cost some money, but we think it is obviously a very um, useful resource for the scientific community. So again, why fungi? Why are we interested in fungi? Uh, certainly for me, I've done spent a lot of my career in, in natural products discovery. So fungi are very metabolically creative um, and also very diverse. So there are more than almost 150,000 fungal species that have been described, but probably that's just scratching the tip of the iceberg as far as the number that really exist and can be cultured. So you know, many of these today, there is not a, a cultivated sample that is available for many of these things. But obviously, you know, that is changing more and more. Uh, and again, fungi are really interesting because they are metabolically creative. They can be used in lots of different ways. Um, and I'll share a little bit more about that um, in the future slides. So again, this is sort of the mycology collection that we have. So again, you know, fungi represents almost a third of what we hold um, at ATCC. Um, and again, you can see here just from this pie chart on the right that it is it is really diverse. You know, I've called out the names of some of the larger parts of the collection, but you can see from some of these very small slices, um, there are lots of things here. Um, you know, there are you know, more than 1800 different genera represented, and of those there are almost 8000 different species. Now, I have worked with fungi before, and I thought I knew a lot of them. I've isolated fungi from both soil and from plant uh, microbiomes, but there was a lot of things in going through this collection that I had never heard of. Um, as a microbiologist, it's also really exciting because you know there's lots of things to be discovered here, and I think that there is the potential for things that to this point have yet to be described. So you know, again, as we start sequencing some of these microbes a lot more to be found within this collection. So again, these next few slides just show you sort of some 
a, a little bit more of a breakdown of what's in our collection. So this is uh, the major file in in the mycology uh, collection, and you can see that we have representatives from most of these. Uh, the ones that we're missing is perhaps not unsurprising. These are you know, uh, the mycorrhizae samples that are so muscular mycorrhizae are found within these different phyla, which are really difficult to, to culture um, exactly. So unsurprising that we don't have those, but you know, we're always looking for places where we can fill in gaps. So if you look at some of the ones where we have sort of a larger number of samples, first being the Basidio mycoder, you can see that, you know, we have again, for almost all of the different classes, we have representatives um, and not just one. In, in many cases, we have a number of different genera in each of these different classes. Same thing with the Ascomycota. You can see that we have representatives from all the different subphyla and um, at least one representative from all of the different classes as well. So then sort of why are we interested in mycology? So I've alluded to this before that they are very metabolic and creative and they can be used in lots of different industrial processes. So these are you know, sort of a breakdown of our mycology collection. And I will say at this point, uh, a lot of this is really guilt by association. So these have been annotated based upon a genera being known to do this particular process. Does not necessarily mean that our strains do, but more that they have the potential to do it. Um, so this is obviously, again, why we're really excited to get the genomes for many of these strains, because it will allow us to be able to start probing that, you know, do they really, are they really able to do some of these things? Or is it just that we think they have the potential because another microbe of that genus is able to do that particular process? So for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to focus on the um, biodeterioration. So microbes that can degrade uh, compounds and materials um, as is the focus of this session. But you can see that the stories that I'm going to share today, you could imagine that, you know, could be any one of these different pieces of this pie. We could create a very similar story for. So again, this is on the bioremediation part. So again, we've looked at um, how the fungi that we have, like what types of compounds can they degrade? And you can see it's, it's a really wide range of, of compounds. So things like uh, petroleum and sort of all the compounds associated with that to plant uh, materials, to you know, heavy metals, to toxins. So, you know, lots of different capabilities of this collection. And again, you know, as we start thinking and, and mining the genomes of these strains, we can really say, you know, do they really have the potential to do this? Um, but again, uh, really diverse collections of compounds that, that our collection has the potential to, to help with. Again, we recently started looking at the fungal collection and are starting to generate a number of different blogs um, on so each of these different areas. So the first one that you can access now is around bioremediation. Again, you can just go to our website and find that. And that will, again, then lead you to the specific strains that we think have the potential um, in this area. And again, as the months go by, you will see a number of different blogs coming up, highlighting different parts of the collection. So then I'm gonna actually now go through a couple of different case studies. And these are really stories that I've pulled from the literature. So again, one of the benefits to, to ATCC is that people are using our strains for lots of different things. And means that, you know, and then publishing um, papers on how our strains can be used. And so I'm gonna pull out a couple of stories that are, are papers published by our customers that to sort of give you examples of the use of some of these microbes. Oh, this one just shows you that the fungal strains 
know are found all throughout the world. So again, this is just a benefit that you don't just get them from one place, but you can see these microspins have been sourced throughout the world. OK, so this to the case study. So this is the first one. Um, obviously, all of you know that um, plastics are becoming a real big problem. Um, you know, they are widely used and, you know, all of the reasons we would like to use plastics uh, are really one of the problems with plastics. So we use them because they're resistant to temperature, to, to pressure, to light, to chemical solvents. This makes them useful for storing materials, but it also means that it's very hard to get rid of them. Um, this picture on the, the right hand side is, is obviously just one example of, you know, we hope that these things, these plastics will be recycled, but quite honestly, many of these are ending up in our landfills uh, and, and unfortunately in our oceans. So, you know, worldwide production of plastics has incre increased through, uh, since the 1950s. It's now, you know, by 2015, this was 100 kilograms per person per year of plastics being prepared. So it's a big problem. And, you know, again, a lot of these are not being incinerated or recycled. They are ending up in our landfills. So one of the solutions to this is that um, can we come up with biodegradable plastics or can we find things that can degrade the petroleum based um, plastics? And both of these could potentially be solutions. And there are fungi that are known to degrade these both types of these compounds. And you can see in the Venn diagram on the right, um, there these are the fungi that are known to degrade these compounds, and we have representatives of all of these in our collection. So again, you know, hopefully we you know, could provide solutions to some of these. So again, this is a paper that was published in 2019. The citation is at the bottom. Again, this is in this case, they took five fungi that they obtained from ATCC, and they looked to see if they degraded um, several different plastics. And, you know, here they were looking at if they were to incubate these fungi with these films of plastic, did they see any growth on them and did they see degradation? Um, and so you can see at the top, you can see this one fungi, this Catonium globosum. This one is both growing and degrading this plastic, this PCL film. Um, but they also tested not just the single fungi, but also a consortium. And in this case, they saw there was a 75% loss of that plastic in 28 days. But really, they could attribute this really to this single fungi, this Catonium globosum, which alone was able to degrade this PCL film within 90 days when they incubated it in the soil. So this is really promising. It's suggesting that you know, there are fungi that could be used to, to, to get rid of some of these plastics. So the second case study is about um, biodegradation of, of VOCs. Again, these are used in lots of different industrial processes, and but they you know, are things that we really don't want getting into the air. Um, and the way that a lot of these are sort of uh, the, uh, the waste of these is cleaned now is actually passing them through a biofilter. And these biofilters, so there's a picture of this on the right hand side. This is sort of passing it through this, um, this large filter that actually has a biofilm. Um, now, a lot of times people have used uh, mixtures of bacteria but those don't work as well under low pH or under low moisture content, uh, which often you find, you know, as a result of these compounds going through um, and the filters, you know, don't, don't often stay wet. So this is obviously a potential for fungi in that they actually do well under low pH and you know, are not going to uh, do too badly under low moisture content. Um, they certainly will be able to at least sporulate and survive uh, you know, for some time under uh, low moisture conditions. So again, in this case, uh, this in this paper, you can see cited at the bottom, they tested four fungi. They um, 
they got from ATCC and then one that came from the CBS collection. And you can see they tested each fungal strain on a solid support with several different uh, VOCs as the sole carbon source. So here that really we're saying if this fungi is able to grow um, in a media where the sole carbon source is one of these VOCs, then it's likely they're able to degrade it because then they're growing on that particular compound and they're looking at the difference between no carbon added and then this VOC as the carbon source. And obviously increased growth with the carbon source added suggests they are now degrading these compounds. They also test them at three different pHs. Again, we talked about the fact that some of these uh, biofilters can get to pretty low pH, so tested at 3.5, 5, and 6. So then this next table really just um, summarizes the results of that study. And so the carbon source is shown on the left-hand side, and then the growth is shown on the um, and each of the different microbes listed here. Uh, plus means that it was able to grow uh, with this particular compound as a soil carbon source. And so really the, the highlight here is this Cladosporidium and then this Exophialia. Uh, both of these grew on all carbon, all compounds as the sole carbon source. So again, these are two fungi that really you know, have the potential to degrade a number of these VOCs. And you know the methods that they describe here, you know, although they did not go on to show that they actually degraded these compounds, would be a useful way to do a quick screen to see if these microbes has have the potential to be used in biofilters. So again, these two case studies hopefully should show you there are ATCC fungi that could be used in bioremediation, and you know, again, because of the large number of strains that we have, we likely have one that could be used uh, for many different solutions. Then the final slide is that um, we're always looking for new microbes to add to our collection. As I mentioned, one of the goals of my team is to think about what we currently have and how it could be used by the scientific community, but we're always looking for new things to, to add to our collection. Uh, I mentioned that we're starting to sequence all of the things that we're adding into the culture collection that we have and we're starting first with new deposits so if you deposit your strain or your cell line with atcc you know we'll make that genome available to you uh, this is uh, these genomes are done with both oxford nanopore and also illumina so these are both long read uh, backbone and uh, illumina fill-ins so these are uh, very high quality genomes and are available uh, once we've sequenced them on the genome portal. Again, the other thing I want to make sure is that everyone's aware of is these microbes can be used both in your research processes, but also can be used for commercial purposes. Um, you just then have to reach back out to ATCC and, and discuss with us how you'd like to use them, but there is not that restriction um, on these microbes. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention. <laughs>